Hi everyone, I'm Becca Gerald. I'm the worship director here at Countryside in Sandusky, Michigan. The message you are about to hear has been previously recorded, but we would love to have you stop in and check out one of our 10 a.m. Sunday services or watch our services online on Facebook or YouTube. Thank you for listening. God bless. So, um, the last few weeks, we have been working our way through just some incredible passages in the Gospel of John. And in John chapter 1, we looked at several key characteristics about Jesus that sets him apart and above from everyone else who's ever walked the face of this earth. Foundational elements of the Christian faith, including the mystery of the incarnation, right? How the Almighty God clothed himself with humanity, fully God, fully man, in the person of Jesus Christ. And then in John chapter 3, we looked at the famous meeting between Jesus and the Pharisee Nicodemus, who was a prominent teacher among the Jews. And that night he was schooled in some very key lessons in entering God's kingdom. One of them being the fact that we all must be born again, born of water and the Spirit, as Jesus said, in order to enter the kingdom of God. And then, of course, chapter 3 is also where we read the famous John 3.16, which is the whole reason behind the arrival of Jesus here on earth, when he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And then last week, we peered into John chapter 4, where Jesus made a stop at really in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of Samaria, a place most of his Jewish contemporaries would have avoided, like the plague. And there at a well outside the town of Sychar, he had a, a life-altering conversation with an outsider, a Samaritan woman who was living with a man she wasn't married to. And as a result of that conversation and that one woman's testimony, the rest of her town came out to see Jesus, listened to his message, and many more became believers and followers of Jesus Christ. And that story is just one example of the many forgotten fields Jesus was calling to our attention when he said in John chapter 4, verse 35, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. So let's dig in this morning to John chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Scripture says that sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. Okay, we're going to pause for a moment, get our bearings in order to understand what the this is in the sometime after this, we got to turn back a page to chapter 5 that we hopped over. Um, and that's where we read the story of Jesus healing the paralytic and invalid in Jerusalem and on the Sabbath day. Okay, so that's made quite a stir in the religious community. And uh, the religious leaders really did not appreciate that. And even more so because Jesus called God his own father, which in their mind was saying Jesus was making himself equal with God. So that's the this that we're referring to when we, when we read sometime after this. And next it says that Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, I got a map here for you, I think. We can put that up there for a second. Uh, which means this probably took place somewhere on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. I think that's on your right over there, kind of possibly where those two arrows are kind of pointing up there. Um, so over there, in either the region of the Decapolis or Syrophoenicia, and for those of you who are geography buffs, I kind of like geography, uh, you should know that the Sea of Galilee is the lowest freshwater lake in the world. It's the second lowest lake in the entire world, second only to the Dead Sea, right? And uh, the Sea of Galilee is actually about 700 feet below sea level, which is kind of interesting, isn't it? It's about 13 miles long, north to south tips, and up to about eight miles wide going across. So that's the Sea of Galilee. That's the area that we're talking about. Verse 2 says that a great crowd of people followed Jesus because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. If we look back to chapter 4, we'll see that Jesus healed the son of a royal official, and the boy had been close to death. And then in chapter 5, as we just mentioned, he healed the paralytic in Jerusalem. And that got people's attention. Those things will do that, right? And so they started following Jesus. 
they saw the signs. We see this, this phrase, they saw the signs. And this is one of those little phrases that I have just raced right over way too many times as I've been walking through the Gospels. What are signs in our world? They're, they're informative pieces of information, right? Um, that, that direct our attention in a certain way. They might be a, a physical sign, like a road sign, right? That you're supposed to pay attention to. Everybody, you're supposed to pay attention to those, right? Or they might be more figurative, like the miraculous signs that we're reading about here in the book of John. In the Old Testament, we often see the word signs paired with the word wonders. Signs and wonders, all of which were designed to get people's attention, direct their attention to Almighty God. You also see this phrase, signs and wonders, in the New Testament as well. And another phrase that you might see if you have an NIV, especially, if you, if you look at the little section titles over the passages of Scripture in the NIV, you'll see signs paired with the words of the end times. A few times you'll see that, okay? Signs of the end times. And that's going to be a message for another day, okay? But, but to, to suffice it to say, we would all do well when we see this word, signs, in scripture to slow down and pay attention to what god is trying to tell us okay whether it is in the world around us or it's in god's word for example do you remember when we were talking about nicodemus back in chapter three nicodemus said rabbi we know that you are a teacher who has come from god for no one could perform the signs you are doing if god were not with them so the religious leaders were noticing the signs around pointing to Jesus. And now here in chapter 6, we see that many other people also were beginning to notice the signs that were accompanying Jesus' presence on earth, particularly the miraculous healings he had performed. So this crowd had formed, and now they were following Jesus. Verse 3 says, that Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. Okay, so here are a couple little details in John's narrative to help us visualize the story. Jesus went with his disciples and went up on a mountainside on the east side of the lake. Okay, now almost all the way around Sea of Galilee, the landscape rises up fairly significantly. I think we got a picture here. Okay, so you kind of see, this is the Sea of Galilee. You kind of see the hills back there in the distance. It goes whew, right up there, you know, hillside, mountain kind of area all around the Sea of Galilee. And then the other thing that we notice here is that this happened near the time of the Jewish Passover. So that would most likely have been in April. In fact, the scholars and historians will tell us that the, the Passovers during the years of AD 30 to AD 32 were all in the month of April. You, you know that Passover and Easter, they kind of switch around from, from year to year, right? Sometimes it's in April, sometimes it's in March. Rarely, every once in a while it's in May. So, but that's, that's what we're looking at. It was in most likely the month of April, this, this was taking place. So this would have been in the spring months around Galilee, where the temperatures peak between about 76 to 84 in the months of March and April there. And then they rise up to around 100, 101 in July and August. Okay, so they have pretty warm summers. And I'm thinking that, that the mountain that John mentions probably looked very similar to this one. I don't know if you can see, but that one off in the distance looks pretty green, doesn't it? Pretty, pretty nice and, and plush. Um, as opposed to, I think we have another shot here, the next one, same mountain, a little different time frame, right? Can you see how brown that, that and crispy that mountain is in the background? Now, I'm thinking this is probably the summer photo, folks, and I'm not 100% sure, but, but I'm guessing this because of the number, I don't know if you can see them, but there's a number of people in the water uh, you know, right there. And in the previous shot, no people. Okay, because you don't go in the water when it's cold, right? You go in the water in the summertime when it's nice and refreshing to hop in the cooler water. So that's what I'm thinking. Brown and crispy, probably summertime. So, but why is the timing of this significant? Well, think about it for a minute. As we can see in these pictures, there probably would have been some softer places to sit on the side of the mountain in the springtime, right? The green, I would much rather sit on nice green grass than on you know, something that's barren and crunchy. I don't know about you. And also, since it's spring, there wouldn't have been much right around that area in the way of crops ready to harvest, right? Not yet, which is important with where this story goes next. Check out verse 5. 
says that when Jesus looked up and he saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. No crops around, again, that they would easily access. And, and we're not talking about just one or two guests here, folks. We're talking about a great crowd. And I love that we get this, this little detail here. He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. You know, Jesus could have just gone ahead and handed them solution. Okay, guys, here's what we got to do. Let's, let's, get it, let's get it going, right? He could have done that. But part of the brilliance of of God's plan was that he was already equipping his followers to equip others who would equip others who would equip others for generations to come as true disciples of Jesus Christ. They were in school. They were in training to take Jesus' message on to the next generations. And you can't equip the next generation if you just give them all the answers without challenging them to work on the solution with you. And that's what Jesus was doing. So Jesus tested Philip. Verse 7, Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. And forget about the where, Jesus. Uh, the bigger question here is how. How are we going to feed all these people? It's going to take more than half a year's wages for each one to just have a little nibble. That's a lot of people. Verse 8 says, another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy, five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Obviously, Andrew hopped right on. He's like, I'm going to go fix this problem. Let's, let's, let's just go ask the front row. It's like, all right, what do you got? <laughs> Nobody, any, this little boy's got a lunch, that's it. Um, the Bible scholars tell us that, uh, that barley bread was food of poor people. Okay, the rich people ate bread made out of wheat flour. And the small fish that the little boy was carrying, probably sardines that had been smoked or dried or pickled to preserve them. Okay, and you know sardines, right? They're not that big, folks, right? Verse 10, Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. All right, so let's, let's do the math here, okay? John tells us there were about 5,000 men, and most Bible scholars would agree that that would mean there were also a number of women and children in the audience as well. If, if we use a, a modest estimate of one woman and one child for every man that's in the crowd, then you get a group that's about 15,000 people, right? So you can see how Philip's concern about how much it would cost to feed them all was valid. I mean, if we were putting this story in today's numbers, half of the average person's annual income globally would be about $5,000. Okay? Now you divide that among 15,000 people, and you got about 33 cents per person to work with. Again, barely enough for everyone have a bite. Not a whole lot you can get for that these days. Verse 11 says that Jesus then took the loaves, he took the little boy's lunch, he gave thanks, and he distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted, and he did the same with the fish. Now this is most likely one of those stories that you heard a lot if you grew up in Sunday school, right? And I will be honest, it was probably one of my top three or four favorites. Why is that? Because it was a kid that saved the day, right? Okay, technically, I know, it was, it was Jesus, right? But, but Jesus used a little boy and his lunch to save the day. And in that way and through this story, Jesus elevated the importance of kids even in his kingdom work. And here's what I mean by that. This story shows us once again that God can work through anyone to accomplish his kingdom purposes. Even a little boy who's willing to share his sack lunch with everyone. There's another important detail in here that I was just reminded of just recently, and, and that is the, the order of events of, of this miracle. Okay, I want you to take a look at this. It says, first, Jesus gave thanks for what they had. 
And then the miracle occurred. Did you catch that? He thanked God for the little he had, and then the miracle happened. Huh. How many times have we put off thanking God for what we already have because we're waiting on him to do the big miracle? And I wonder how many miracles we have missed in our lives because we have it all turned around. Like maybe the reason, one reason we don't have 500 or 5,000 people in this congregation is because we aren't giving God thanks for the 150 that have been here this year. I'm just saying, maybe, maybe we've got it turned around. And you know the other thing I really love about this passage? This miracle started with prayer. Where have you heard that before? Simple prayer of thanksgiving. Start with prayer. You want to see God at work in your life, in your family, in your church, in your community, in your world? Start with prayer. All right, let's continue on. Verse 12 says that when they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. And here we see God's amazing power to create. God demonstrating that power through his son, Jesus Christ. You know, critics over the years have tried to explain away this and and so many of the other miracles of Jesus. I once even saw a TV show that tried to explain the feeding of the 5,000 here by showing people pulling food out from the folds of their cloaks and, like, sharing it with others around them. It's like, oh, look, it's a miracle. You know, all this food's just appearing out of nowhere. I think that's kind of ridiculous. I mean, come on. If that were the case, Jesus probably wouldn't have said this line in verse 26, if you look down a little bit further on the page, when they found him the next day on the other side of the lake, he said, very truly, I tell you, you're looking for me, not because you saw the signs that I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. If they had just, you know, had everybody had a little snack, pulled it out, they wouldn't be following Jesus. Jesus wouldn't be saying that to them. No, they were at that time looking for Jesus to provide for them Again, and while we have that verse up, uh, do, you have, do we have John 6, 26? Is that, is that on there? It's not on there. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, so I mentioned that one to you. Um, it mentions, again, those signs. Jesus mentioned the signs that, that they had just seen. And the point being there that their focus was off when they found him the next day. They were looking, again, not because of the signs and what God was trying to get their attention on Jesus for, but their focus was on the food. And I want you to keep that in mind as we go back now to verse 14. It says that after the people saw the sign Jesus performed in feeding the 5,000, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. You see, they saw the sign. They recognized the fact that this miracle Jesus performed was not some illusion or magic trick or cheap sleight of hand, but it was a sign from God. They knew something incredible was going on as they said, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. What prophet were they talking about? They were thinking about the prophet that Moses had promised back in Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 15, when he said that the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites, and you must listen to him. That's what Moses said way back then. So they were looking for somebody this whole time. They were looking for somebody on par with their guy, Moses, right? The prophet Moses, as evidenced by the signs and miracles that this person would do. So let's think about it for a second. Jesus was healing the sick, okay? Don't really hear a whole lot about Moses healing the sick, except maybe the, you know, the snake in, you know, on, on the pole in the desert. Or uh, uh, they were also talking about um, how Jesus had, had turned the water into wine. And if you remember, back in Moses' day, he turned the water into something else too through God's power, right? Same color maybe as wine, but not wine. It was blood. And now Jesus fed 5,000 people with what? A few barley loaves, a couple of fish. 
And the last time they'd heard of a miracle like that was when God fed his people through Moses and manna in the desert. Think about it. Have you ever heard of someone, anyone, feeding such a crowd as this, the way that Jesus did? Other than Jesus, I can't. I can't think of anybody since. He must be the prophet Moses promised us, or that's what they thought. But as I mentioned before there, their focus was a little off. Check it out. Verse 15 says that Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So the people on the mountainside that day, they saw this amazing miracle. And that, coupled with what they already knew about Jesus, was enough in their minds to seal the deal. This is the guy. This is the prophet Moses told us about. He must be the one God was sending to deliver them from the hand of the Romans as Moses had delivered God's people from the hand of the Egyptians. So the crowd, they were going to come and they were going to make Jesus king by force. But that wasn't God's plan. That wasn't Jesus' plan. That was their plan. See, they couldn't see what God sees. They didn't know what Jesus knew. They wanted someone to come and lift them out of their current distress, just like we all do sometimes in this life, right? Someone who would take care of their immediate earthly needs. But what they didn't realize is that God's plan in sending his son Jesus was for a much, much bigger need. He didn't come to save us from the Romans or whatever opposing force is currently in government, wherever we are. No, he came to save us from our own sins, which would ultimately result in an eternity apart from our Heavenly Father, were it not for God's great salvation plan through Jesus. Let's continue in verse 16. It says, when evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. So the Gospels of Matthew and Mark tell us that after he fed the 5,000 people, Jesus immediately told his disciples to get into the boat and go on ahead of him across the lake while he dismissed the crowds. I just I want to make sure you catch that from those other Gospels so you don't just think that his disciples are abandoning him, okay? Uh, but, but he gave them instructions. They followed his instructions to go ahead and cross the lake. And Jesus, again, knowing that the crowd was intending to come and make him king by force, sent his disciples on ahead and dismissed the crowds broke up the party, said, everybody, it's time to go home. Yeah, we've got other things to do. And then Jesus went further up into the mountainside to pray. Verse 17 continues, by now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. And a strong wind was blowing and the waters grew, grew rough. By the way, apparently storms can pop up pretty quickly on the Sea of Galilee. Waves reaching as high as 10 feet. Now imagine for just a moment that you are, are rowing against waves, okay, even, even one to three feet high, okay, because I think that's probably the point where most of us would start saying the waters grew rough, right, don't you think? Um, quick show of hands here, well, just to wake up everybody. How many of you have ever tried rowing or paddling against a strong headwind, okay? Uh, it's tough, isn't it? Man, it's a lot of work to get anywhere. And we see in verse 19, that they had rowed about three or four miles. That, that's a long way, even when the waters are calm, folks. But if you're facing rough weather, that's tough. And they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. All right, just pause for a minute. What do you think your reaction would have been in this scene? I mean, imagine for just a second that you have never heard the story of Jesus walking on the water before. Okay, and all of a sudden... In the middle of this tough nighttime scene, strong winds, rough waters, you see someone walking on the water towards your boat. At the very least, it would probably have been a moment you'd never forget, right? You would never forget that image of Jesus coming to your boat. But I bet most of us would have shared the disciples' reaction. They were frightened. They were scared. What did Jesus say to them? Verse 20, it's I. Don't be afraid. He could tell. They were freaked out, right? 
And then they were willing to take him into the boat. And immediately, the boat reached the shore where they were heading. And so first, we got the feeding of the 5,000. 5,000 plus, let's be honest, okay? Now we got walking on the water. Two miracles, one day. One day, two miracles, two signs, right? And not just any run-of-the-mill minor prophet type signs. No, we got Moses parting the Red Sea kind of signs here, right? Why are these signs included in John's gospel? Let me give you really quick Pastor Kyle's top four reasons for these two miracles or two signs in one day, okay? Here you go. And again, these are just put together pretty quickly. And you may discern more on your own as you are walking through this passage. Um, and I'm just hoping that this will be a springboard for God to continue to speak to you as you read through the Gospel of John. But here we go. Top four reasons for these two miracles in one day. Number four, something we already mentioned, to elevate the importance of children by including the boy and his lunch in this story. Again, just like he elevated the importance of women in our last story, at, of the woman at the well. He was always doing that. He was eating with sinners, the tax collectors, stopping to heal the blind and the lame and the leper, addressing personally those people that the rest of society would have ignored or forgotten. Here he was raising up two people's attention, including his disciples, the importance of not overlooking the children in the audience. Number three, to show God's compassion. Show his compassion for people, their hunger. Help us see that he does care about our needs here and now. He, he didn't just come that time to give us, to show us the plan for eternal life, but he also showed his concern for the immediate needs. That's why he fed the crowd. That's why he healed the blame, the, the, the lame and the blind and the leper. He was meeting imme immediate needs as well. Number two, to demonstrate God's power over the laws of nature. Okay, he demonstrated in the feeding power to create and in walking on the water, power to suspend those laws of nature. And finally, at the end of this gospel, the Apostle John gives us the big reason, not only for these, but for all the miracles that Jesus performed. If you turn back a few pages to John chapter 20, you'll read in verses 30 and 31, it says that Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So the purpose of the signs, according to John, was to focus our attention on Jesus so we might believe and have life in his name. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior of all mankind. And I'm hoping that you have all been reading along or listening this morning and picking up on all the signs that we've touched on, pointing us to Jesus. And I hope that you have all seen or heard enough already to come to a point where you're convinced, you're really convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. And even more than being convinced, you've come to a point where you have trusted him with your life. You've trusted him to give you life, like the living water we talked about last week. And if you continue on, when you get home this afternoon, looking in John chapter 6, you'll see that he even goes on to talk about him being the bread of life. And if you haven't Yet ask Jesus to be your Savior and Lord. I want to urge you to do that even today. And if you do, please let me or someone else you trust know so we can be praying for you and encouraging you on your walk with God. And if you find yourself still not quite sure, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to go home and read the rest of the Gospel of John. Just begin here with, with chapter 6 and read through to the end. See the other signs that John records that point us to Jesus. And then I pray that you'll be ready to make the decision to receive him with all that you are. And one more thing. If you have at some point made a decision in your life to follow Christ and you have yet to be baptized, I want to encourage you to let me know. If you, if you are thinking maybe it's time, maybe God's prompting you to do that, let me know. We'd love to help you with that next step of faith. 
We're going to be hopefully having a, a, a service of baptism here on the 22nd, and we would love to see you included in that. So with all those thoughts, and for the rest of us, I just want to encourage you to continue to read through God's word and continue to look for the signs that point us to Jesus and what he's got for us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for this passage, two miracles, one day. God, amazing things that the people and the disciples got to see in your presence. And God, we're so thankful that you've recorded those things in your word so that we too could see and participate in the wonders of God demonstrated through your son, Jesus Christ. And God, all of that shown to us so that we can believe that he is your son, the savior of the world. And I pray, God, that you would help uh, those that may be thinking about it, maybe struggling with that decision. I pray, God, that you would just encourage them and, and reveal to them the truth in your word and that you would continue to strengthen them and help them on their journey. I pray that you'd help all of us to continue to grow in Christ and his likeness in the days ahead. God, we love you so much. And we want to pray all these things in your precious holy name. All God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you for listening. Check our webpage, countrysidefm.org, for more sermons or to get connected.